Today I am talking about Phu Quoc. It's a pretty large island in the Gulf of Thailand. It's actually closer to Cambodia than it is to Vietnam. There are beautiful beaches on every coast, although some of them are swimmable and some of them are not. It is hot all year round. The main activities here are just hanging out on the beach, eating delicious seafood, watching the sunset and the sunrise, cocktails. <laughs> Even if you came here and did absolutely nothing, I am confident that you would really, really enjoy yourself. That said, there is a lot to do. As per usual, I will tell you first what I did not do, what I chose not to do and why. First up, I did not visit the National Park. The National Park has been closed off almost all the time at every entrance and guarded by military employed security guards. A big portion of it was sold to the Vin Pearl Tourism Conglomerate to build an amusement park and a zoo on the ground and develop hotels and restaurants and sort of a tourist area, which they have done. The parks are complete and I would say the shopping tourism area is still dead and still somewhat under construction, but really almost there. Anyway, for that reason, it seems that you are only able to get into the national park if you are a local or at least a Vietnamese person who can pass themselves off as a local, saying that you are just driving through to get to somewhere else. The second thing I did not do, the truck or truck, please forgive my pronunciation. And I am horrible. Oh! The Chuklam Hokwok Buddhist Zen Monastery. If you've seen my prior videos, you know how I feel about temple tourism. I am very interested in seeing historical places, culturally relevant places. And if those are houses of worship, great, I would love to see them. I am not interested in visiting gigantic, newly built sites that are kind of popping up everywhere to attract that retired grandma and grandpa. They're all, I think, a misuse of beautiful natural scenery. And they're very, very similar. Gigantic, uninspirational artwork, high entrance fees usually included as part of a tour. Just no. That's what this place is. It was built in 2012. Not for me. The third thing I did not do, that amusement park I mentioned. I don't have kids and I'm almost 40 years old. Maybe I've lost my zest for life somewhat. I don't know, but I don't feel like riding Ferris wheels and roller coasters for an afternoon. Yeah. Last thing I did not do. There is a local waterfall that's sort of a popular watering hole. And the reason I didn't go is twofold. Number one, it's dry season. The waterfall is dry and dry season. Number two, it seems that it's become sort of a miniature ecological catastrophe. It's a very popular nights and weekends place for locals to go and sing karaoke and picnic and eat and drink and apparently they just leave their garbage all over the place. I don't want to see that, so I skipped it. Now let's talk about everything I did do, the good and the bad. First things first, the ubiquitous day tour here is operated by John's Tours. Even if you buy it through your hotel or you buy a four or five island tour from another company, it will either be run through John's Tours or it will be a copycat of the exact same itinerary. You can choose a shortened version or the extended version. The shortened version is 20 bucks. It's a four island tour. So you ride out on a boat. You can order pretty exotic seafood to be barbecued for you for lunch at a very small additional cost. And you visit each island. Each island is set up pretty much the same. There's a small area for swimming or if the beach is kind of rough, you can take out one of the little plastic kayaks or paddle boards. The whole beach, including rocky outcrops, is set up for for lots of Instagram opportunities. So if you're an Instagrammer, you can truly enjoy yourself. I personally don't do selfies, but I love watching other people do it, especially couples and families who buy these cute little matching tropical print outfits. I find it adorable. So that's a big section of these islands. There's also a bar, a restaurant, a guy selling coconuts, and oftentimes shaggy local beach dogs, which is kind of fun. I forget if it's in between islands or after the island hopping is done, but the most important part of John's tour is definitely the snorkeling. They take you to a spot that is still pretty beautiful. Large parts of the reef are bleached, unfortunately. They also serve a seafood lunch on the boat that's included in 
in the ticket. Really nice grilled shrimp, porridge, fried tofu, vegetables, the typical. Also, if you ordered any of the fun seafood earlier in the morning, that's when they serve it to you. You can also get beer and drinks and stuff on the boat. If you purchase the shortened tour, your tour is over. You're taking the boat back to the main island. If you purchase the $20 extra extended tour, you will go to a fifth island. This fifth island has been developed by Sunworld, another huge tourism corporation in Vietnam. First stop at Sunworld is the water park. So they have huge water slides that are really, really scary, that sort of thing. I find this somewhat more thrilling than an amusement park because at least there's water on a hot day and it could be kind of fun. But again, I'm an old lady without children, so I think I don't have as much fun at places like this as maybe teenagers or young families. From the water park is, for some people, the highlight of the whole day. And that's taking the monorail back to Phu Quoc. So instead of going back on a boat, you have this beautiful view of all five islands as you float high in the sky back to the mainland. This monorail ticket alone costs almost $20. So if you plan on going on the monorail, honestly, you might as well just spend the whole day on one of these tours. The day starts at 8 a.m. and you get back to the John's Tours office at around 5 p.m. A lot of people at that point choose to extend their day out with the second most popular tour, the nighttime squid fishing tour. This is only $15 and I do not recommend it. I thought it would be legit fishing. Like I thought we would go out on a squid boat with the thousands of bright lights and insane netting system and maybe learn something. I don't know what I was thinking. They just bring you back out on the same little tourist boat. They give you a hand reel with a fishing hook on the end, which I've never even seen before in my life. My grandfather taught me how to use a fishing pole when I was, I think five years old. And then they bring you sort of barely off offshore with the city easily in view. How they could expect anybody to catch anything in this scenario is beyond me. And nobody did. Actually felt bad for the guys who really enjoy fishing and they thought this would be an interesting trip. Also, the included meal on this tour was really bad. Like bad enough that a lot of people just didn't even bother eating it. I guess if you're staying in a hotel that doesn't have a good view, it's fun to see the sunset from the boat, but this is a waste of time. Another popular type of tour here is the Phuc Quoc Specialties Tour. The island is actually known internationally for its really high quality agricultural exports. Among them, honey, pepper, fish sauce, sim wine, and pearls. I made the mistake of going to each of these places individually. I wasted a lot of money and a lot of time that I didn't have to if I had just set aside a full day to go on one of these tours. They only cost 15 or $20 for the whole day of driving you around to these places that are rather far apart from each other on the island. Of the farms, the bee farm was my hands down favorite. I learned more there than I ever did in school about the life cycle and roles and environment of honeybees, the process of becoming a beekeeper. And on the farm, they have, of course, a shop where you can buy their different infused honeys. My favorite was cinnamon. They also have durian, turmeric, ginger, a variety of flowers including violet and myrtle. They were all genuinely delicious. It was the one thing I bought where when it was done, I thought, oh, I wish I had bought more of the honey bear. They also have a little restaurant on the premises where you can have a cocktail or an iced tea with the recipe centered around their honey. And I swear it is the best cocktail I've ever had. I loved it. My second favorite was the peppercorn. I had no idea how little I knew about peppercorns until I learned more about peppercorns. And again, in addition to the little bit of sunshine, education, hanging out in nature, they have a little spot to relax and they make a really cool pepper tea. It's very hot, it clears your sinuses. It's great if you have a cold or if you need to warm up. I bought a jar and I really enjoy it. 
Food Hog Pepper is considered the best in the world. So if you're a cook, they have an array of products that doubtless will interest you more than they interested me, including red, green, black, and white peppers, pepper chili salt blends, pepper honey, pepper sauce, which is mixed with the local fish sauce. Another internationally exported specialty that we should talk about. There are lots of fish sauce factories on the island. In Vietnam, fish sauce is as common as olive oil in Italy, and people are equally as serious about the quality and the grading. Phu Quoc fish sauce is so famous that it's actually Vietnam's first European Union certified product of designated origin. Around Phu Quoc, there is a special species of anchovy, and only this anchovy, only caught in this archipelago, only fermented here, and only bottled here, can be called Phu Quoc fish sauce. It takes over a year to complete a vintage of fish sauce. The best you can buy is the first extraction of a great vintage straight from the factory. The Sim Wine Vineyard was also really interesting to me. They make wine from fruits that I didn't even know existed. Sim fruit, noni fruit, likewise seahorses. They make liquor from seahorses. But it's not only liquor, it's also non-alcoholic syrups, heavily sweetened with sugar that you can use in cooking desserts. They sell candies, slushies, ice cream. I personally had this slushie. It was a little too sweet for me. I am not sure how locals drink the liquor. I believe they drink it straight, just sort of in shots. That's way too much for me. I did mix it with tonic water with some success. I don't love it, but I understand how if you grow up here, you could really, really enjoy drinking it as an aperitif. It definitely tastes as good or better than Campari or pasties. The last specialty here that they typically include on the tour is pearls. Phu Quoc is known as the Pearl Island. There are tons of pearl farms here. If you go into any big pearl shop, they'll give you a whole demonstration about how different types of pearls come from different types of oysters, and they show you how they culture them and explain how long it takes for each type to grow and the proportion of poorly formed pearls, like the ones I'm wearing. It's all interesting enough, but unfortunately, it's a big sales pitch for terribly overpriced pearls. And I don't say that as somebody expecting things in Vietnam to be cheap because it's Vietnam. Au contraire, I'm very familiar with the prices that fine jewelry achieves at local auction in Boston and New York and the prices charged by estate jewelers. And the pearl jewelry here is crazily overpriced. Beyond the places included on the tours, there are also several places that really are worth going on your own. I spent a lovely afternoon at the local museum, which features prehistoric artifacts, local fauna preserved in formaldehyde, antique porcelain, some wartime paraphernalia, a gallery of portraits of the local Communist Party chairman over the past 20 or 30 years, of course, as well as a display on local industries. It's rather small, about two and a half floors of a mansion. It seems to be privately owned by the owner of the hotel next door, and and it's obviously been invested with so much care from the community. Despite being small, it's incredibly thorough. If you're sunburned and you just want a day in the shade, this is the best place to learn everything you can about the island. If you're interested, at least somewhat, in history and religion and culture, another place of worship I really liked going was the Ding Kao Shrine, which is this tiny old little temple built out on a rocky ledge near the water. This day that is where the local fishermen go every single morning to pray for a good catch. Another place essential to understand the local economy and culture is the Hanming Fishing Village. There's a market where you can buy live seafood and there's also a string of really basic seafood restaurants lined up on jetties along the beach. The variety of seafood you can get there, particularly exotic shellfish, is really really great. There are a few species that that are truly local to Phu Quoc Island, not just the anchovies I mentioned before, but also slipper lobster and flower crab. There's also stuff that's just rare and incredibly expensive at home, like conch, that's easily available.
available here. Everything is priced cheaply compared to what I'm accustomed to in New York City. They charge by the kilo. I recommend you go into a place with marked prices because if you are a tourist and you go into a place with market prices, they will charge you well above market prices. In terms of minimum weight, if they see you're a single person, they'll cook half a kilo of this or that for you. The preparations are really, really simple. Most of the stuff is just grilled or just boiled and they'll give you a little tiny chili sauce, some salt and a lime on the side. So while the prices are cheap and you can try a lot of things, the meals are also not very sophisticated. Related on places you have to eat at least once, you have to go to the night market. I've become a bit inured to the flashy, busy Asian night markets. It's typically a lot of junk merchandise and a lot of sketchy street food and a lot of people yelling at you to buy something and a lot of people getting very physically pushy and you get tired of it. So I considered not even going to this night market and I am so happy I did. There's just as much fresh seafood available here as there is in the fishing village or maybe slightly higher prices, but again, extremely reasonable prices. I wouldn't buy anything here in terms of, you know, I certainly wouldn't buy a pearl necklace here, but they have little tchotchkes and souvenirs like really large size decorative clamshells that would go for much higher prices in New York City. Definitely a great spot to go in at least once. One place unique to the island that's extremely historically significant and I believe everybody should visit is the Coconut Prison. Coconut Prison was built by the French when they were already really, really losing the first Indochina War. It was built to jail and torture prisoners of war and political dissidents. Of course, we all know the Indochina Wars turned into the Vietnam War or the American War if you're Vietnamese, which lasted for an entire generation, the jail continued to be used for the same purpose. It was a place where South Vietnamese with American overseers imprisoned and tortured North Vietnamese prisoners of war and political dissidents. I, of course, am aware that torture exists in war. I am unfortunately very aware that much torture has been perpetrated by United States soldiers. Being an American, it is something I obviously, I think obviously, disagree with entirely. What can I say? Some places make you want to scream and make you want to cry, and this is one of them. And I think for that reason alone, you should go, because if young people don't bear witness to the mistakes of the past, they'll be repeated. Onto something still sad, but less so. Did you know that there are only three species of Ridgeback dogs in the world? The Thai Ridgeback, the Rhodesian Ridgeback, and the Fuquok Ridgeback. A Ridgeback dog is one that has a little mohawk of fur along its spine that runs in an opposite direction to the rest of its fur. Now there are tons of mutts on the island running around with this characteristic, but over the past 10 years or so, a breed standard has been developed for the Fuquok Ridgeback and excellent specimens have achieved really high prices among breeders and collectors in Saigon and Hanoi. I mean $5,000, $10,000, $15,000 per dog. So I thought coming to the native lands of the Fuquok Ridgeback, I would see some really great facilities for them. Unfortunately, that was not the case. I went to the dog farm, as they call it. It was not up to Western standard. First of all, I didn't feel that confirmation standards were high. Secondly, all the dogs were living outdoors and they were all flea ridden, which I found absolutely shocking. I didn't take pictures because I didn't want to get kicked out of the facility, but I did see two dogs with what looked like untreated serious medical issues. One, his entire body was covered with mange, which is incredibly painful and easily treatable. There's no reason to let it get to that point and torture the poor animal. And the second dog was limping around in a manner that made me believe he had a lower foot injury. There didn't appear to be any open skin or wound, so it wasn't an infection of that sort. It must have been an untreated broken bone that had since healed. While the dogs were well fed and they seemed loved and trained, the owner seems to be making money off of the $2 entrance tickets he charges to tourists and perhaps selling the dogs, I'm not sure, and not putting 
that money back into the medical care of the dogs. Another strange animal encounter I had was at the crocodile farm. Vietnam has several crocodile farms and they sell skins to manufacturers of exotic leather goods like Hermes, Quan Pen, and Gucci. For that reason, it's a lot cheaper to buy crocodile skin goods in Vietnam. Though to be clear, I mean cheaper, not cheap. <laughs> <laughs> you will still pay six or seven hundred dollars for a small handbag. I am not morally against consuming animals, but I don't want the animals I consume to live in misery, die in fear, or experience torturous pain at any point in their lives. So I was very curious to see what was happening here. I don't know if I really learned anything. Hundreds of crocodiles live here with maybe 20 to 40 grouped together in a big pen with a big Pool. None of them were displaying aggression, none had obvious health problems, all seemed well fed. When I walked by the first time, they all jumped in the water quickly, and after that, they ignored me. They're silent animals, they open their mouths just to regulate their body temperature. They're also very fast runners, very fast swimmers, and cuddlers. They like to drape themselves on top of one another, even when there's open space available. The owner of the croc farm doesn't speak English. English, so I wasn't able to ask him anything about the husbandry or slaughter of the animals. It's on the northeastern coast of the island, pretty far away from anything else, and there's nothing there worth buying. So I can't say it's worth going if you've seen crocodiles before. Given my experiences with the dogs and the crocodiles, I didn't know what to expect at the Vin Pearl Safari Park. This place is completely modern and extremely lovely. There are hundreds of species of exotic animals here. They all seem well cared for and in good health. They live in large, open, well-built enclosures. Depending on when you go, a ticket costs the equivalent of $25 or $35. They're more expensive during school holidays because obviously a lot of people like to bring kids there. Another thing they'll force you to do during holidays that you normally don't have to is to buy a ticket that includes a free meal. The free meal here is gross. Honestly, despite there being several restaurants on the campus, none of them have good food. Not that I expected at a zoo. And I do call it a zoo because the majority of the space of the park is a zoo where you can walk around at leisure and view the animals in their exhibits. The safari is a separate section, but it has the same animals as the zoo. So you're not missing anything if you decide to skip the safari. If you do go on the safari, it's really just a 15 minute ride on a tour bus full of screeching children where you do get a few feet closer to the animals, especially the iconic big animals like the giraffes and the lions. But if time is limited, honestly, skip the safari section. Get an ice cream cone and walk around. I much preferred observing the elephants, tigers, monkeys, etc. in my own time. They also have a huge aviary with hundreds of birds. They have a special section for reptiles. Really, there are so many animals to see here. The only types of animal that they've inexplicably put at the amusement park rather than on the safari grounds are underwater creatures. The aquarium is actually at the amusement park. Although they do sell combo tickets for the amusement park and the safari, and there are tour guides who bring people to both parks in one day, I think that's crazy. The zoo is interesting enough and large enough to take up a full day. I enjoyed it so much I actually spent two days there. The combo ticket doesn't save you much money, maybe $10, and it really cuts short your time at the zoo. I liked Fu Quoc so much that it would be difficult for me to pick out my favorite thing on the island, but this zoo is really high on the list. The last place that's completely worth visiting on your own is Starfish Beach. It is a beach that is littered naturally with starfish. The locals aren't allowed to catch them and eat them, so it's not artificial in any way. They didn't put them there for tourists. They've always been there, and it's just really, really beautiful. Now let's talk about the basics, what to eat, where to stay, and how to get around. I'll handle the fastest one first. How to get around is easy. Grab is all over the island. I never experienced a significant delay in getting a grab cab, even at relatively busy times of day. You can also rent a motorbike here for around $10 or $15 a day, which is a little more expensive than other places in Vietnam. And also some of the shops here are more strict about checking your license. 
opinions. So your mileage may vary, literally. Oh, and the last little tip I wanted to mention is that although there is grab cap, there is no grab food. If you want to order food for delivery to your hotel room, there's a website called foodquokdelivery.com. There's Western food as well as local food on there. Moving along, let's talk about what to eat. The food here is so different and so good. I will try to narrow it down to the five local foods you absolutely must try. Number one is actually a combo of two different local foods. There's a crab here that is indigenous to the island. It's usually called a flower crab, but sometimes a guard crab. The meat is known to be particularly sweet. If you like crab, it's definitely worth eating. It's definitely tasty. Although these crabs tend to be small, so they are a lot of work. Related to this is crab blood pudding. So they use the blood and juices from the crab to create a porridge that features the crab meat. The number two most popular local food you absolutely must try is the raw herring salad. It's possibly the island's most popular food. It's tossed with shredded coconut and wrapped with pineapple, rice noodles, green papaya, carrots, lettuce, mint, and peanuts dipped in a slightly sweet sauce. And it's incredibly refreshing. It doesn't taste fishy at all, despite being raw fish. It's a perfect lunch for a warm day. You have to try it. The number three very local food that you should try if you're there in the right season, March or April, is Bolitas mushroom soup. These particular mushrooms only bloom on the paper bark trees in the island's primeval forest during these two months after it rains. Even though they have a slightly bitter taste, their rarity makes them a very expensive seasonal item. Another super local dish that you just don't see elsewhere is horn scallop sinews. So these look like little sea scallops and they're prepared like little sea scallops, usually grilled with a bit of kumquat juice and oil on skewers that are cheap. Two to three dollars for a skewer with four or five sinews. But they aren't actually scallops. They are the sinew connecting the scallop meat, which is tasteless and thrown away, to a huge triangular shaped shell. The last food you must try that is in indigenous to Fuquat is the slipper lobster. Slipper lobster in terms of size, appearance, taste, and texture is sort of halfway between a shrimp and a lobster. If you're craving more of a lobster flavor but don't have the budget for imported lobster, this is a fantastic choice. It's hard for me to stop here talking about all of this delicious food. So definitely check out my video on the island specialties where I talk about more of them, like abalone, sea cucumbers, egg squid, various snails, and different kinds of local noodle soups. So where do you eat these local specialties? My hands down by far favorite restaurant on the island is the Xin Chao restaurant. I was on the island for a long time, a couple months, and I ate it lots and lots of restaurants, down and dirty local places, street side places that are only open in the morning, fusion places geared towards Westerners, and random seafood restaurants recommended by locals. And this is the place on the island. It's a 100% local traditional style of cooking. So 90% of the must try local dishes are on their menu. And the manager speaks English extremely well. Unlike a lot of the local places on the main drag that are only open for dinner, this place is open for lunch as well. Where to stay? A ride to pretty much anywhere from the airport is not going to cost you more than $15. The west coast of the island has a mix of people obviously but caters much more to westerners. It's walking distance from the main drag that goes from south to north and walking distance to the main town with the shopping and the night market. On the east side of the island, supposedly the most beautiful beach, the one the locals say is the absolute best, is Saddle Beach. Over there, the prices are cheaper. You kind of need a motorbike to get around. It's almost all Vietnamese and it's catering more to Vietnamese tourists. So more karaoke, no Western style restaurants, far fewer people speaking English, whatever. There are beautiful places to stay on every coast. I would just recommend that when you're 
for a hotel, you double check a few things. Number one, a lot of hotels actually don't even have ocean views and they're still pretty expensive. So if you're paying the big bucks, make sure you get the view. Number two, as I mentioned before, some of the beaches are not swimmable. Beaches can be rocky, dirty, inaccessible, littered, have lots of jetties or God forbid houses or restaurants on the jetties that just make it unpleasant to try to swim around there. So really take a careful look on Google Maps before you decide. I hope this little guide has helped you decide to visit Fuqua because it's fantastic. Or if you were already set on coming, I hope that it's helped you in your planning process. I'm a solo traveler 100% of the time. So if that is of interest to you, please subscribe. I also have links below to my Instagram and my blog. My blog is very active. So if you want details on any of the things that I have mentioned in this video, more of the details, are in written form on the blog. Instagram, I can't say I keep up with that much, <laughs> but I would appreciate your support. Last but not least, I hope you have a beautiful day and I'll see you next time.